Thank you so much, uh, Hansel and Meribeth, for that anointed worship. And now we'll enter God's presence and request Pastor Alex to lead us in the Bible study. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Greetings to you all in the sweet and precious name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who's coming very, very soon. It's indeed another awesome privilege that God has given each and every one of us to come together in prayerful attitude, joining from India and different parts of the world to learn from God's word. I want to really thank God for the Zoom platform that God has given to us. Though we are not able to meet face-to-face -face in person to learn the word, I believe this is all equally powerful. And uh, it is such a privilege to learn God's word from numerous places and uh, to be in the presence of God. Where the presence of God is, there is deliverance. This is what we believe. And this is what the word of God has confirmed, that where two or three would gather in the name of Jesus, he has promised that he will be there. He is there in the midst of his people. Therefore, we believe that God is here with us and he will speak to us. All we need to do is allow the Holy Spirit to interpret the word of God to us. If the Holy Spirit interprets the word, then there is deliverance and there is healing, there is upliftment, and there is revival within the community of the body of Christ. Amen. Now, before we get into the scripture and reading and learning the word of God, if you can uh, uh, switch on your, your videos and uh, join for the Bible study, it'll be so useful for the person who teach uh, the word of God so that we can see your face and it'll be more lively also. Now, uh, today, uh, we're going to learn from the last parable from the Gospel of Matthew chapter 13. It will be a, a, a revision or it might be a summary of the entire thing, uh, before which I want to lift my hands and bless each and every one of you who have joined today and, uh, and to learn God's word. I want to speak a word of blessing over your life. And I pray in the name of Jesus that your children shall be blessed. Amen. Your jobs and businesses shall be blessed. Amen. I want to speak a word of blessing over your homes. Amen. It will be the presence of the most holy God. Amen. Your dwelling place shall be holy. Your dwelling place shall be blessed, will be protected by the power of the most holy God. And I pray that our generation will lift this mighty word of God. We shall be fruitful unto God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. Hallelujah. Today we're going to learn from the Gospel of Matthew, uh, chapter 13, verses, uh, verses 24 to 30. Gospel of Matthew, chapter 13, verses 24 to 30. This parable talks about, is being taught by Jesus Christ, and this is the last parable that we're going to learn, though it comes in the previous verses, and we're going to compare these two parables today. The, the parable of the net, where we learned last week about the good fish and the bad fish and the power of the net. And that was our prayer, Lord, use me as one of our strings, one of the strings in the net, Lord, that we will gather the people for the kingdom of God, use us mightily for your kingdom's glory. And there is one more very similar parable uh, which we need to learn so that the entire parable which is in the Gospel of Matthew will be completed. Let's not leave any parable because every parable has its own power. So today we're going to learn from the Gospel of Matthew chapter 13 verses 24 to 30. Gospel of Matthew chapter 13, 24 to 30. This parable is known as the parable of the weeds and uh, the wheat. The weeds and the wheat are the tares and the wheat. So let me just uh, share my screen so that we can start reading the word of God. Amen. I hope you can see the screen. Uh, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Now, today we're going to learn about the parable of the weeds and the wheat. It is 
one of the parable that Jesus spoke earlier in this chapter, and uh, again, which is very similar to the last parable that we saw last week, which is the parable of the net, which is all known as the good fish and the bad fish. Now let us start reading the scripture. Now, uh, let me read that scripture to you. Please follow the screen or your Bible in your own translation. Another parable Jesus put forth to them saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. Verses 25, but while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way, or sowed weeds among the wheat and uh, went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to Jesus, or uh, sorry, came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? He said to them, the owner said to them, an enemy has done this. The servant said unto him, do you want us to then to go and gather them up? But the master said, no, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. So don't do it. Let it grow together. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at the end of the harvest, I will say to the reaper, the reapers, the uh, first gather together the tares and bind them up in bundle to bury them, to burn them, but gather the wheat into the barn, but gather the wheat into the barn. Now, this is the parable that talks about the wheat and the tares, okay? Now, let's see what Jesus really wants us to understand from this parable. Let me be, I'll be so, I'll be a little fast because we need to cover a lot of things in this parable. Now, these are some of the things that we're going to understand from this parable. Background of this parable. Now, in what context did Jesus speak this parable? Now, whenever Jesus spoke a parable, there was very similar practices within the Jewish community. So that why did Jesus take the parables and compare with the practices or the traditional behaviors of the Jewish communities because to make this parable easily understood by the, by the learned and the unlearned who surrounded Jesus Christ. So that when, when he relates the parable to the then and their practices, they could easily understand it. So we will firstly look into the background of the parable. Then we will look into the difference over here. Now, what is the field which is mentioned here? Is it the church or it is, is it the world? Because there are different in, I mean, interpretations which has been given to the scripture. So we need to understand what did Jesus really mean when he said the field or the ground over there? Is it the church? Did Jesus refer to, to the church or to the world? We will see that very quickly in this parable, especially. Now, the dual interpretation of the parable. There are two ways in which people have interpreted the parable or in which we can understand this parable, which has been spoken by Jesus Christ. Now, we will see the dual interpretation. There are many, but we will just stick on to just two, just for our Bible study today. Now, who is the sower in this parable? When we read that few couple of verses, there are plenty of questions I know that has come to our mind. So these are the questions that, will, that we will quickly address. Who is the sower in this parable? The next thing is, who is the enemy? Because Jesus said, in the night when people were sleeping, an enemy came and sowed the weeds among the weeds or the good seeds, and he left. Now, who is the enemy which has been uh, highlighted in this parable? The next thing is Jesus' warning to the church. Now, church means you and I. We are the church. So what does Jesus want to warn us through this parable to the church? And finally, when we learn this parable, we know this one thing for sure. When Jesus said, 
gather up all the weeds and bundle them and burn them. So this parable not only talks about the peripheral concept of the believers and the unbelievers, the evil people and the good people, this parable also very powerfully and profoundly talks about the eternity of the evil and the good, the people of the world and the people who are righteous people, the saint of God. So though this parable is very, very simple, this parable highlights very powerful concept about the eternity, where we are going to stay, we're going to live forever. Where will the unrighteous live? In this world, last week we learned, God has given a, a couple of time or, or in a season, a season where the good and the evil will live together. So therefore, whenever you hear this word, uh, this party has is going to discuss about peace treaties or two countries are joined together to for peace treaties. You know, these these kinds of, you know, I mean, what do you call the, uh, I mean, uh, you know, uh, initiatives taken by great leaders of the world. We know what would be the outcome because Bible simply says, very profoundly has said, God has given a season where good and the evil will live together. So there are many people who have asked, if God is there, then why is evil in this world? We learned about it last week. So today I'm not going to touch on those areas, but today we're going to, I'm going to just highlight on a couple of very important things so that we will learn a few things from this parable. Now let's go into these parables very quickly. Number one, what is the background of this parable? All right, the first thing we need to understand is this, there is the background in which Jesus Christ was teaching. Now, the background of the, in agriculture society of Christ's time, when Jesus lived, many farmers depended on the quality of their crops. So this was the, this was the traditional method of farming. So they didn't have the present weed killers or you know, uh, high-tech engines and motors to find out which is the weed and which is the real wheat. So that was not possible. So the main concern of the farmers, who the farmers who would become rich depends upon the quality of their crops in which they produce. So in order to, you know, in order to destroy another farmer, the one and the only way is this, so weeds among the good crops so that the farmer will take a lot of time in order to find which is the good and the bad seed. It is not possible unless until they, the crops have to grow together to a maturity. Therefore, this is the only way the enemy will attack a farmer who, who works hard to bring the good crops. This was the background in which uh, it was the background practice in which uh, uh, it was a background practice of Jesus' time. So therefore, whenever a bad seed is being sown, the farmer does not immediately tend to pluck it out because he would never identify whether it is the crop or, I mean, a wheat or the wheat. So the, therefore, wise farmers, what they did was they allowed both of them to grow together till the time of harvest. So that it was only during the time of harvest, the farmer could understand which is the good one and which is the bad one. Now, this was the kind of practice during the time of Jesus. With this concept, Jesus brought in this beautiful parable and not only growing of identifying the evil and the good, but Jesus also wanted to bring up to say the final destiny of the evil and the good, which is very, very important. So this is the parable. This is a background of the parable why Jesus brought it. Now, there are dual interpretations given to this parable. You know, many, many scholars and uh, many... Can you please uh, mute? Can you please mute whoever it is? Please mute your mic, please. Yeah, thank you. 
Many commentators bring in two understandings of, uh, you know, interpretations to this parable. Some people say this parable talks about the condition of the church. What do you mean by the condition of the church? A church in one church or in the universal or in the local church, the presence of good believers with the presence of you know, bad, pro falsely professors who say that I'm a Christian, but they do not show any quality of righteousness. So this is one kind of interpretation that has been given by some scholars and commenters. Commentators, they say this talks about the church and not the world. But there are some other commentators who say, no, this parable talks about the world and the church. So the good, the true believers and the evil people. So these are the two uh, dual interpretation which has been given to this parable. Both might sound correct, but let us see what did Jesus really mean in this parable? Of course, we have similar con con uh, context in the first interpretation where it is said within the church community, there are good Christians and there are false Christians. People come in sheep's clothes saying that they are Christians. How do you identify them? And uh, they keep on interpreting from that concept. All right. Now, in this parable of wheat and the weeds, we will see what Jesus talks about this parable. Number one, who is the sower in this parable? It is so easy. Jesus Christ declares that he himself is the sower. He himself is a sower. Now we will see how do we interpret this one. He spreads his redeemed seed, that is the true believers, into the field of the world. Genesis, Galatians chapter 5, 22, when we read, through the grace of God, these believers, that is you and I, we begin to bear spiritual fruits. Amen. So therefore, when we are there in this world, in the field, when we are scattered into the entire world, we represent the kingdom of God. We represent the righteous people. We represent the power of the Holy Spirit. So therefore, we are called as the weeds, which is the good crops. And we, have, we grow by the power of the Holy Spirit. When Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is at hand, he means we as the righteous people and the wicked people coexisting together, but God is going to harvest one day. He is going to show to the world who are the real righteous and who are the evil people. That day is not far away. It is at hand. Amen. So, but now we need to understand now the good seed is the children of God and the sower is Jesus Christ himself. We are being sown in this earth to bring forth the glory of God. We are being sown himself in this world by himself to show and to declare and to proclaim how great we are to God for our salvation, how glorious is our God for his power and his righteousness because he came to seek the lost. We were lost and we are found. We are being sent or sown in this world to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. Therefore, the, the work of the sower is for us to declare the glory of God. Amen. Don't bother about the weeds that grow among us or within us or near us. We are there to declare the glory of God. Amen. Now, who is the enemy in this parable? Now, it is so simple, obvious, we can see the enemy in the parable is the Satan, is the Satan. The first thing we need to understand is this, God always does righteous thing, and Satan always does unrighteous thing, amen. So these are the differentiation that we need to understand. Among the world, in this world, the one target of the enemy is to sow weeds, amen so that the righteous people will be confused and it will be against enmity to the righteous people, but the righteous need not worry about it because the sower who is Jesus Christ himself, the righteous God fights for the righteous people, amen. 
in opposition to Jesus Christ, the devil tries to destroy the works of Christ. This is what he is meant for. And the Bible says in just Gospel of John, chapter 10, verses 10, the, uh, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. These are the three works of the devil, steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus Christ came that he can give eternal life in abundance, life in abundance. Therefore, the enemy in this parable is the Satan himself. Now, we read the, uh, uh, the explanation. How do we say that? That the sower is Jesus, the enemy is the devil, and the world is not the church, but the world, the field is the world. How do we get to know that? It is Jesus himself who explained this parable from verses 36 to 43. Now, verses 36 to 43 says, then he led the crowd and went into the house and his disciples came to him saying, explain us the parable of the weeds of the field. Now, this is what, this is how Jesus explains this parable. Jesus answered, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man. So therefore, sower is Jesus Christ himself, the son of man. The field is the world and not the church. All right. So therefore, this is the interpretation that we need to take. The seed or the field is not the church. The field is the world. And the good seed is the son, sons of the kingdom. Who are we? Who are the good seeds? We are the sons of the kingdom. We are the good seeds. And the weeds are the sons of the evil one. So the evil one are called the seeds of the wicked, the sons of the evil one. And the enemy who sowed them is the devil. Now, who is the enemy in this parable? This is the devil himself. The heaven is, is the end of, and the harvest is the end of the age. And the reapers are angels. We don't want to spend time in that explanation. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so will it be at the end of this age. The son of man will send his angel they will gather out his kingdom, all causes of sin and all lawbreakers, and throw them in fiery furnace. And that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. Now, Jesus himself explains this parable to the disciples when they ask, Jesus, please explain us the parable of the weed and the field. Now let us go. Now, what is the field in this parable? The church and not the world. I don't want to explain more about it. We have to learn some more. Therefore, we will go into it very quickly. All right. All right. Now, the field is not, not the church, the world. But there is also a warning that we have to not ignore. Jesus gives a warning here. We are not to take up ourselves or to uproot or judge unbelievers because the difference between the true and false be it is not always obvious. God is the only righteous judge. When I see an unbeliever, do I have to judge him by saying, you are a sinner, you are condemned? People of God, God is the only judge. We know the difference. We are told to share the gospel and pray for him. This is what we need to do. One thing we need to understand, we can easily tend to judge an unbeliever. But this parable says, don't judge. God will be the judge. Because when the servants came and told the master, master, can we go and uproot the weeds? And the master said, don't do it now. Let it grow. Let it grow. End of the day, God will take care of it. Therefore, people of God listening to me, when we see unrighteousness around us, when we see an evil person around us, we tend to judge him. But the Bible says, no, we are told we are been sown by the righteous God, not to judge anybody, but to share the gospel. Because we know the difference. We know the difference. We were once weeds. Now we are being planted in the church as wheat, as good crops. Hallelujah to that. 
When I see a believer who doesn't know the truth, I'm not to judge anybody, condemn anybody, because we never know whom God can transform. Any sinners can be transformed. We never know. That's what we know. Heaven will be full of surprises. The people whom we thought will never be saved can one day will be saved by the power of the gospel. Therefore, let me leave you with that. Tears are not to be judged. Leave it in the hands of the one who can take care of it. Judgment belongs to the Lord. He is the one who does everything. But one thing we need to understand, everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will not enter also in the kingdom of God. It also, we also have to understand this parable within the church community. When I see a believer who does not try to, you know, come back to the power of the gospel, who has been bound, who has been bound by sin, it is our privilege to pray. And we have to speak the word of God into his life and God will bring back. And not only that, it is not only God who has to do that. It is my willingness and my, 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 my you know, it, it is my duty also to come back and say no to sin and yes to God. It is not only the work of salvation that, that is from God. It is my response to the sal salvation message and uh, the salvation work of Christ work of Christ is by God and my response to salvation brings back to the presence of God. Amen. So people of God, we need to understand I'm no one to judge anybody. It is God who can do everything. Now, this parable gets into another realm of explaining the, uh, uh, the, the, the eternity, eternal matters that has been discussed in this parable. What are the two things? Hell or heaven? So this is what I want to concentrate a little bit this evening. Hell or heaven? What is the concept of hell and heaven in the Bible? We will see that very quickly. And the second thing is, this is one thing that we need to understand. Can anyone be promoted to heaven by rituals? So this is some of the things that people have asked me. If a person die in sin, can doing a ritual or prayer over that dead soul, can we promote that person from, from, from hell to heaven? Is it possible? Why do I take this subject? Because some of the Christian traditional people also believe in this concept. They say that, don't worry about it. If he dies in sin also, it doesn't matter about it. We will perform rituals. We will pray over the soul. And what happens is that person will be transformed, promoted from the hades into the, 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 the heavens. So don't worry about it. We will do that. What does the Bible say about it? Can, can we do that? Do, can we believe in this doctrine? Now, to whom was the hell prepared? To whom was the hell prepared? So this is another question that we will discuss. Who will be sent to hell? Who will be sent to hell? One of the things what the Bible says. Now, who has the authority to put anyone in hell? These are the questions that we need to answer. And, this, and the last thing is Jesus teaching about eternity or Jesus teaching about hell. And finally, do I have the assurance that I will be in heaven? This is some of the question that most of the religion feel, find it very difficult. Do I have the assurance that I can reach heaven? Or uh, uh, will I, I don't know about it. Some people say, no, I don't know about it. It's all in the hands of God. Well, these are some of the statesmen, statements that will really confuse us. So what does the Bible say all these things? And one of the things we need to understand this is this, is there a hell and heaven? Is it biblical? Is it, is it, is it uh, literal or is it uh, just uh, an allegory what, which we see in the Bible? So we will go very quickly into some of these things and we will ask the Lord to give us the assurance and we will pray, Lord, yes, Lord, I am in you. And finally, we will see what is the privilege that we have in heaven. We will look into that. Now, biblical concept of hell. What is hell? Does, what does 
hell really mean according to the word of God? Hell is the place of suffering originally prepared by God for the devil and his angels. Gospel of Matthew 18 verse 9, 25 verses 41. Now, these are some of the things what the Bible say. Why do we believe in the Bible? Because of many reasons, but one reason, let me tell you. This is the word of God. Heaven and earth will pass away, but the word of God remains forever. People come and go. Kings and princes and authorities and powerful people have come and they have gone. But the Bible, the word of God remains forever. Yesterday, today, and forever, it has the power in it. And this word of God says, this was a place prepared by God for devil and his angels. Now, there are a few things that we will learn before we come into the next line. What are the other names that we see for hell? What does the Bible say, other names for hell? Now, in Greek, it is said as Hades. In Greek, it is said as Hades. In Hebrew, Sheol is another word used for hell. Gehenna is another word used in Jewish and Christian eschatology. All right. When you learn Judaism and Christian eschatology, you learn this word Gehenna. So this is another word used for hell. And finally, we learn another word, lake of fire, lake of fire. Now we will see some more words which is being taught by Jesus Christ himself. Why Jesus Christ? Because he is the author and finisher of everything. The alpha, the beginning and the end. He is the one person who has taught about hell more than heaven, more than any people in the Bible, more than any people in the Bible. Some people have asked me, well, Paul did not, Apostle Paul did not use this word hell. So does this, does this mean that, that he is silent about it? No, he's not silent about it. Apostle Paul is the one person who taught and preached the entire message of Jesus Christ as it is. Now, the words which he used is entirely different from what we see in one word called hell. He used similar words, parallel words like condemnation. He has used uh, similar words like injustice will come under the wrath of God. Now, what is condemnation? What is the wrath of God? There are many words that Apostle Paul, according to his intellectual, in, in intellectual studies, he has compared, brought in those words. It does not mean that since he used, did not use his word hell, does not mean that he ignored the word, the place, or literally, no, he included everything into these two words or many words, all right? Now, Hades or Seol is simply the place or realm where the spirits of people go when they die. Now, there are many questions that you can ask. When I die today, I mean, if a people die today, a righteous man or an evil person, if he dies, where does the soul go? Does it go to heaven or does it go to hell immediately? There are many explanations given to that. So in the Old Testament, we read from Genesis 37, 35, we read Jacob saying one word, for I will go down into the grave unto my son, Joseph, mourning. You know, therefore, there is another place where you need to understand it is compartmentalized, a concept that we get over here. Uh, the Hades and Seol, it has been compartmentalized according to the Gospel of Luke chapter 16, where the realm of the dead and the soul of the righteous go for a resting place, a resting place. The final judgment will decide the final, you know, I mean, eternity of the righteous and the evil. So therefore, now the dead souls are, are, are there in a place called, it is called the resting place. And it, this has been understood widely and believed widely by the biblical scholars saying that the final judgment will be the time when the Lord God himself will cast the antichrist, will cast the fallen angels, will cast 
all these, the false prophet, the old serpent, everything into the lake of fire and the evil people into the lake of fire. So therefore, this is the concept mainly accepted by the biblical scholars. So we will leave with that there. Now, who will be put in hell? In a very simple context, we will see, according to the Gospel of Matthew 25, 41, Satan and demons will be put to hell, in hell, will be put in hell, very clear statement to that. You know, and a, a person came to me say, saying that, I want to write a thesis, pastor, please help me. I asked him, what is the title? And he told me that the title is Salvation to the Fallen Angels. I immediately told him, you cannot write this thesis because you will not finish it. Why? He said, let me try it. And he went home. I said, okay, go ahead. After two months, he called me again and said, pastor, can you visit my home? I went there and I, he just told me, pastor, you're right. I couldn't write this thesis because the Bible clearly says there is no salvation for the fallen angels. There is salvation only for the fallen humanity. Amen. God is faithful. God is gracious. When God is giving this opportunity to be saved through the finished work of Jesus Christ, don't delay to accept this salvation. Fallen angels do not have the salvation. It is only to you and me, fallen humanity, who can receive the salvation. I lift my hands and say, amen. And thank you, Jesus, for the salvation through Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Now, who will fall into hell? Who will be put in hell? The wicked one, according to the parable, they will be put in hell. The final destination of, for those who reject Jesus Christ, according to 2 Peter 2, 4 to 9. Hell is a final destination to those who reject Jesus. I want to tell you, God is merciful. He gives many number of times for us to repent, 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 because this place is horrible. And the only chance for us to go to enter heaven and hell is before our death when we live today. That's why the Bible says today is the day of salvation. Today, not tomorrow. Today. Nowhere in the Bible, Bible says tomorrow. Bible always says today. Today, today. Amen. It is just like the lottery ticket selling in some of the places. Today, today, today. I want to tell you people of God. Today, Bible says, repent, come back to God. The spirit of unclean, unsaved people, the spirit of the unsaved will be put in hell. All right, the next one. Who has the power to put anyone to hell? I want to tell you, the Bible says, Revelation chapter 118, very beautifully says, Gospel of Luke 12, 5 says, Jesus holds the key to to key of death and Hades. God alone has the power to cast someone to hell. And Bible says clearly says, don't be afraid of anyone who can kill you, but be afraid of the Son of God, of God who can kill your body as well as your soul, put your soul into hell. This is whom we need to be afraid of. Jesus says, don't be afraid of man. He can kill only your body. He cannot touch your soul. But the Bible says, be afraid of God who can kill both your body and put your soul into hell. God says, God is to be worshipped with the reverence. Amen. The Bible says, don't take salvation for granted. Don't take worship for granted. Don't take holy life for granted. Because... God is a righteous judge. He will give ample time of opportunities. If I ask you, how many times can you say that God has given opportunities? I would probably say, sorry, I cannot count it because his mercy is forever and ever. Hallelujah. I thank God. Now, let us quickly learn into why is, is it so important that we need to learn about hell and heaven? Because Jesus Christ taught this. He came from heaven. And he knew the seriousness of this place, hell. And he has taught it. We will read it very quickly. Jesus described hell in great detail. 
I still remember when I was in my teenage, there was a, there was a film called uh, Hell and Heaven. Uh, it is called The Burning Hell. After we viewed it, uh, after that, uh, after that for, for, for many number of months, it was like, hallelujah, Lord, hallelujah, praise the Lord, Lord, keep me away from sin and everything. It was such a powerful uh, a movie. It is called Hell and Heaven. That talks about, you know, the, the, the very, very drastic and dangerous place hell is. Now, let me see. Let us very quickly see what Jesus talks about hell over here. <laughs> Jesus says in Gospel of Luke 16, 23, he says the place of eternal torment. There is no peace there. There is no kind of safety there. It is eternal torment. I don't have time. Please let us go very quickly. Of unquenchable fire. No, no firefighters can quench it. The entire ocean cannot quench it. You know the ocean, the kind of water they have. The Bible says, but no ocean water can quench I'm saying that. No ocean water can quench it. Because Jesus said, unquenchable fire. Gospel of Mark 43. Where the worms does not die. Who love to be in the worm? Nobody. Gospel of Mark 948. I have the verses just before you. You can read the verses. Where the worms does not die. Where people will gnash their teeth in anguish and regret. The, the place. When does a person gnash his teeth? When he regrets. When he finds he lost the opportunity, he will gnash his teeth. In hell, people will gnash their three teeth seeing they missed the, the opportunity given by God about salvation. From which there is no return, even, the one, even to warn the loved ones, the rich man and the Lazarus. Abraham says like this, sorry, you, he cannot return. Neither you come to this place, a place of no return. He calls hell as a place of out, utter darkness, outer darkness in the gospel of Matthew 25, 30. It also compared as Gehenna, which is the dumb, the waste baggage in the wall of Jerusalem, where only you know, it is filled with dirt and stink. Only animals will eat from there. This place is also compared as Gehenna. Jesus has warned very, very specifically, be careful about your salvation. Salvation is freely given to those people who have taken time to believe and accept Jesus Christ as a Lord and personal savior. Whenever it is said it is free, it should not be taken for granted. You and I have to pay a price. Jesus paid it. All Jesus and the word of God asks us, believe, open your own mouth, confess that you are a sinner, that Jesus Christ is only the savior and my savior. When we confess it in faith, we get to heaven. We are free from this horrible place. Amen. Now, this is one thing that I want to discuss here. Can anyone be promoted to heaven by rituals? I have come across this question by some of the traditional Christians. No, pastor, there is a doctrine that says after a person dies, of course, they all know that he was not a righteous man. He was a sinner. But, you know, the priestly people or the people who, if you pray for that soul of the dead person, they can be, trans they can be promoted into heaven by rituals. Now let me read the scripture to you from Ezekiel chapter 14, 12 to 20. I don't have time to explain. This is self-explanatory, so we don't, we don't need to explain this, these words. Now this is what God spoke to Ezekiel. The word of the Lord came again to Ezekiel saying, Son of man, when the land sinneth against me by, by trespassing grievously, let me just, uh, just a minute. I'll put this thing down. Yeah. Okay. 
I hope you can see this. <coughs> now, it says, Son of man, when the land sinneth against me by trespassing grievously, then will I stretch an, out my hand upon it, and I will break the staff of the bread thereof, and I will send famine upon it, and will cut off man and beast from it. This is what God says. I will cut off means I will kill man and beast when they commit sin, when they trespass against me. Now, these are the words we need to specifically learn. Now, God says, though these three men, who are these three men? Men called Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it. They should deliver but their own souls. By thy righteousness, says the Lord. It is very specifically said, though these three men are there, Noah, Daniel, and Job, in the land where God cursed because of transgression, they cannot save the land. They can save themselves only through their righteousness, say the Lord. Who is this Noah? Who is this Daniel? Who is this Job? They are powerful people. But the Bible says they are called as righteous people. They are called as powerful people who have seen the glory of God. But the Bible says even these three people are there in the land. They cannot save a soul. They can save only their souls. Now it, it comes again. If I cause noisome beasts to pass through the land and they spoil it so that it becomes desolate that no man pass through, uh, through because of the beast, though these three people were in it, they shall not deliver a son or daughters. They shall never deliver their sons or daughters. They only shall be delivered, but the land shall be desolate. They cannot deliver the sons or daughters through any rituals. They are righteous people. They are holy people. They are seeing the glory of God. Daniel, look at those people, how God saved these people. Though they are there, they cannot save their sons and daughters. Nobody. And 18th words, though these three men were there, as I live, says the Lord, they shall deliver neither sons and daughters, but they shall only be delivered by themselves. Pestilence, famine, death, or whatever it is, I or you, or no holy saints, or no priest, or no rituals, no prayers can save anybody. Only your righteousness will save you. And if a person die in sin, that is the end of it. Because the Bible says, we are given one chance to live and, and we die. Then judgment, that is the seed of it. No priest, no church, no pastor, no father, no mother, nobody can save anybody. The Bible says very clearly, if I die in sin, that is the end of my life. God has given the opportunity today. If we can come back and say, Lord, forgive me. I cannot start praying for my daughter, my son, or my wife, or my father, or my mother. We all have to pray for ourselves, repent for ourselves, and come back to ourselves to the saving grace of God. Amen. And finally, we will get into it. If I just don't say about heaven, this topic is not answered. What is heaven like? <coughs> Heaven is the dwelling place of God. What does the Bible say about heaven? Heaven is the dwelling place of God. Job 22, 12, Deuteronomy 26, 15. It is the throne room of God. We sang this beautiful song this evening. Lord, it is your throne room of God. Earth is your footstool. Heaven is your throne room. It is the place of for God's full glory. It is the place of God's Complete glory. Hallelujah. Home of the righteous are all believers who die in Christ. It is a home of the righteous. Amen. Now, what is the nature of heaven like according to the Bible? The place of great glory. In the Old Testament, God said, I will not give my glory to any man. In the New Testament, when Jesus Christ came, 
he said in the gospel of john father you have gave, you have given me the glory and i have given this glory to the believers in the new testament we got the glory through jesus christ now in heaven, it is a place of great glory. Gospel of Matthew 13, 43. We can never anticipate or explain that great glory which we are going to see when we get to heaven. Amen. A place of continual worship, according to Revelation 19, 1 to 6. A place where the believers and the angels will continually worship him because the time will not be enough when we see that glory of Jesus Christ. Our time will not be enough to thank him and worship him. All the place that will never end. It is an everlasting to everlasting. If this is everlasting to everlasting, hell is also understood to be everlasting to everlasting. Once we go to hell, we can never come back, says the word. Now, once we get to heaven, we need not come back to any other place. It is from everlasting to everlasting. A place of untamed by evil. A place where evil cannot tame it. Evil cannot be present there. In Revelation 21, 27, we read like this. No night, it is completely light. No curse, no pain. No crying or sorrow, no death in heaven. This is the nature of heaven. Now, what is the believer's privilege in heaven? Your privilege, my privilege, our privilege in heaven. We belong there. Hallelujah. Can we say hallelujah to it? We belong there. Hallelujah. Hebrews 12, 22 says like this, the children of God belong to heaven. We are enthroned there. Ephesians 2, 6. I don't have time to explain. We are enthroned. We are seated in the heavenlies. Enthroned there in heaven. We have our names recorded in heaven. Your name. That's why, you know, I tell to the parents who would ask for the meaning of the names they're going to keep to their, put to their children. I would tell them, please don't give this responsibility, opportunity to the pastors to name your children. If you, the, the, the naming ceremony or the naming privilege is given to the parents. Name the pet child that the Lord has put into you because the name that you name a child is the same name which will be written in heaven. Hallelujah. Our names are recorded in heaven, Hebrews chapter 12, 23. We are being sent by the one who lives there. Jesus Christ who was in heaven, he came to this earth and said, I come from above and I'm going to send you the place and be with me where I belong to. Amen. And finally, we have our treasure stored in heaven. That's why Gospel of Matthew says like this, store your treasures in heaven, not in earth. So let me be a little more fast and conclude. Heaven is a beautiful place. We are not to miss it. Our privilege to going to heaven is now and here. Amen. Now, very sadly to say, teaching about hell and heaven today, there is decline in the beliefs in hell among Christians today. Many Christians do not believe in heaven or in hell. I have heard with my ears people saying, it is here and now. There is nothing called, you know, hell on heaven. If you go through sadness, you're in hell. If you go through good times, you're in heaven. That is the wrong teaching of the word of God. Let me tell you, people of God, Many people do not preach about hell today. In churches, less messages are heard about hell and heaven, more about ultra grace and super grace or whatever it is. I'm not going to criticize anybody. Some churches believe as I just told before, but very be very careful. There is a place called hell. There is a place called heaven. Jesus did not come to condemn the world, but to save the world. But there is a good news that I want to say. Do I have the assurance that I can be in heaven? A good news today for this evening, people listening to me. Heaven is ours forever. How? Because the Bible says there is therefore no condemnation to them who are in Jesus Christ, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. There is always a clause there. Who, not, who do not walk after the flesh, but after the spirit. If we are in Christ, heaven is our place. 
Gospel of John 14, 14 1 to 13. Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. Jesus said, in my father's home, there are many mansions. If it were not so, I wouldn't have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. Where I am, there shall you be also. Hallelujah. There is an assurance for the people of God. For God so loved the world that he gave his one living God and son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish to hell, but will have everlasting life in heaven. Hallelujah. I want to tell you a good news that people can avoid hell. How? Through Jesus Christ of Nazareth. If we believe that Jesus died for my sins on the cross of Calvary, if I confess with my own mouth that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior, my name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, that means I am assured that I will be in heaven. Hallelujah. Let me, mm -hmm. let me just leave you uh, with these words here. Shall we all unmute and shall we read this word? 16, Gospel of John, uh, chapter uh, 16. Sorry, Gospel of John, chapter 3, verses 16. Can we read that? I just, uh, yeah. 316. Can we read these words together, please? And we will... Say a word of prayer and conclude. Shall we all unmute and read this word? One, two, three. For God, so God so loved the world, Amen. The good news I want to share today: We have heaven. Our name is written in heaven. I want to leave you a question. Are you, is your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life? God bless you. Over to Sister Susan. Amen, amen, amen.